Well, let me invite you to go ahead and turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Uh, this is uh, where we are. We're still walking through just this one chapter here. We've been here for a couple of weeks now. and We're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 2, starting with verse 18 and following. Now, this morning we're looking at our fourth church. If you remember, Jesus is writing these letters uh, uh, to the churches, seven churches specifically in Asia Minor. And so we've had an opportunity so far to look at three of these churches. Today we're looking at Thyatira. And it's a church that is, is there in Asia Minor. And it is also known as the corrupt church. And we'll see why that is this morning as we dive into this passage together. The corrupt church, Thyatira. And so we're going to be looking at this. I, I have a map that I want to show you here this morning. I, I showed you this. You can see it just sort of to the southwest of Pergamum, which we looked at last week. It's roughly about 40 miles. And this is the smallest of cities that we're looking at in this series, the smallest of these seven cities that we'll be examining here. In fact, it was, it was really just sort of originally a military outpost in the beginning. It wasn't something that had a lot of substantial value to it except for militarily. It was uh, anybody coming up from the, from the south that was headed into Pergamum, uh, they would have to go through this city and and so it became sort of a speed bump along the way if they were going to try to do battle with anybody there but in Pergamum but the church in Thyatira is the least of the churches we also as we start doing our background there we begin to realize there's not a there's not a lot of theological significance. That's, they're not really known for any sort of academia or, or it's certainly not really a trading city. And so uh, a lot of things just, it never really took off. It's a smaller town that really never get, uh, gained a lot of ground, but there was a church there. There was a, a body of believers that worshiped the Lord there, but it just wasn't really a theological haven uh, and many scholars believe that this church was one that was probably one of the youngest of churches. It was a, it was a church where it, it just uh, the people there, the, the worshipers there were, were, were not quite as mature as some of the other churches in the area. However, as we dive into Revelation chapter 2, starting with verse 18, and we look at this church, we begin to realize real quickly that this small church is the one that received the longest of letters. As, as Jesus was revealing truth to, to, uh, to John and he was recording this truth to present to the churches, we begin to realize that this is the longest of the seven letters. And so we, we have quite a, a passage to read here today. I, I don't want to leave any of it out. I want to allow God's word to just be spoken here this morning. The Bible tells us that the word of God never returns void. So I want to read it. We obviously don't have time to dive into every verse and every word of this passage because it's just simply too long. I wish I did, but we don't. And so I'm going to read it in its entirety and then I'm going to do my best to just sort of lay out some truths to you here this morning to help you understand what this letter was all about. So let's read here together. Start Starting with verse 18 and following. So it says here, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a, a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, he says, your love and faith and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refused to repent of her sexual immorality. 
Behold, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and the one who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and as earthen pots are broken in pieces even as I myself have received authority from my father I will give him the morning star he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches so that's a long passage and there's so much there to tr sort of take away from here this morning. But as we, as we look at this, we're, our, our prayer should be, God, what is it that you want to teach us as we look at this passage? God, what is it that you want to help us understand? We know that this was a specific letter written to a specific church. And in this letter, Jesus uh, commends them for several things that they have done really well. And then he also, he reveals to them the things that he holds against them. And so as we read this, we might just say to ourselves that this has nothing to do with us since Jesus is writing this. But as we know with Scripture, everything that we have in the Word of God uh, can have application in our own life. And so as we read this, we want to try to take away that which we need to, that which Jesus may be helping us to understand here even this morning as we read through this, this passage and, and sort of break it down. Well, just like Jesus had said to Ephesus and also Pergamum, there are things that Jesus commended them for. In other words, as he was writing to them, he, he said, these are things that, that you are doing well. These, as I look at who you are as, a, as not only individuals, but collectively as a church, living out your faith as followers of Christ, I see these things, and they are certainly worth mentioning. Now, the first thing that Jesus points out that is commendable is that they are a people of love. That they are, they are loving as a church. And you know, as I look at that, I think this really shouldn't surprise us because as Christians, we understand that love is one of the true identifiers of who people are as believers. But then again, we also have the first example, the first letter that we wrote, which was to Ephesus. And we know that they were very theologically sound and yet what Jesus said to them was this I hold against you you've forgotten what love is all about and yet here we see where one of the things that Jesus commends them on is he he commends them on their love if you remember when Jesus was questioned about the commandments when Jesus was questioned about what is the, what is the greatest commandment that Jesus' reply was basically this. He said the first and great commandment is to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. He even went as far as saying the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And I want you to just allow that to, to soak in here this morning as we think about what Jesus is saying to this theologically young church this not as mature church he says one of the things that you're doing well is you're loving God and you're loving others he points out that they had love and they were holding on to this and they were loving Jesus and loving others I think it's very interesting that Thyatira was strong where Ephesus was weak I think it's really interesting. We looked at Ephesus and we talked about how the church of Ephesus was supposedly a more mature church, but somehow they had forgotten how to love. 
And so we read through this and we begin to sort of see this unfolding as we, as we read through this. But regardless, they were commended for their love, even though uh, there were other things that Jesus held against them. And I believe it's worth taking note. Jesus once said this about believers. He said, just as I have loved you, you are to also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So one of the things that we're going to notice here is that an identifier, a mark of a true Christian is one who can love well. And so that becomes very important for us to to understand and to hang on to. And so I want you to hang on to that as we continue to walk through this text here together. The second thing that Jesus commends them for is faith, is faith. And we begin to realize as we think about faith that faith in God really has several different components. A lot of times when we think of faith, we think of faith being that sort of foundational thing that exists, that that faith means we actually believe in God, God whom we can't see, but we believe in Him because we believe in Him based off of faith. And that is absolutely one of the components of faith. But we also understand there's a second element to faith, and that is one that that basically commits to God because our trust in Him is so strong. There are many things in the Scriptures that teach us uh, uh, about how to live out our life, and we have the ability to either be obedient in those things or to not be obedient, to follow the things of Christ, to, 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 to follow Him and to be committed to Him. And it's by faith that we carry these things out. If we didn't truly believe that God exists, and if we didn't truly believe that we could trust Him, then our life as we live it would be much different. And so we begin to see here that what Jesus says to them, He says, man, you guys, you guys have faith. And He doesn't go into great detail of this but I can only imagine that there's there's these uh, this idea that that we've already talked about where these two components of faith really come into play you see the the the, the reality is is that scripture calls us to walk by faith in fact the apostle Paul he once said walk by faith and not by sight And what he's talking about there, as we think about that, is he's talking about the reality that there's a contrast between truth and perception. In other words, what we know to be true and then what we just perceive as truth. And so there's a big difference there, a big contrast. And so when Paul says, we are to walk by faith and not by sight, he's saying, don't just live your life according to what you can see, but what you have faith in. And so very strong and challenging words as we think about it. And I think this is where so many Christians struggle these days, and it's with the lack of faith uh, and, and, and not allowing faith to be the basis of how we live out our life. And so here Jesus says, you do it well, you have faith, you, you're following, you're, you're believing. And this is something that we as believers should take note of as we that they were people of love, but they were also people of faith. The third thing that Jesus points out here is that they were serving. They were a church that served. They were, you know, we, we realize that service, Christian service, is a part of who we're supposed to be. We recognize that the Bible is very clear that for every believer, every person who has been redeemed through Christ Jesus, who has been saved by faith through, I mean by grace, through faith in Christ Jesus, every single one of us as true disciples has been given a gift, a spiritual gift, to be used for his kingdom and for the glory of God. And so we understand as believers and followers of Christ is that we have not only been given a gift, but we have a calling to serve Christ and to serve others with our gift. Jesus says for the church at Thyatira that they are serving. They are are committed to Christian service. The Bible is clear that we should be doing this. 
And so as we look at the things that Jesus commends them for, we, we hopefully can find that we ourselves as believers and followers are also serving. Peter said it like this. He says, as each of us has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. You know, here at Cross Point Church, uh, we understand this. We know that, that each and every one of us are called to serve, that it shouldn't be that 20% of the church does 80% of the work. It shouldn't be. We're all called to be a part of what God has called us to. And so we understand that. In fact, we sum up our entire mission statement by saying this, serve your church, serve your city, and serve your world. I mentioned just this morning at the onset of this message how we can carry out all three of those as our mission to our church, our city, and our world. And so here we see where Jesus commends this church of not only their love, not only their faith, but also their service. Now there's one other thing he mentions here, and I want to offer this one to you as well. I think this is really interesting. He says, and your endurance. In my study, I was wondering, you know, why it was that this church who, who maybe was not quite as mature as other churches might have been so, so good at just sort of enduring. And I started thinking about the background study that I did on this city and how it was sort of a military outpost and how it seems as though every every enemy of Pergamum would march through Thyatira and, and, and man, just how they must have had to rebuild that city over and over and over as, as these conquerors came through and, and how they must have just gotten really good at saying, well, they're gone, let's rebuild, you know, and just continuing to endure and how that might have translated into their ability to spiritually endure in the things of Christ. And so here we see this, this church that was commended for their endurance. In verse 19, we read these words where it says, I know your works, and then Jesus lays them out, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. So these are the four things that Jesus recognizes about the church there in, in, in uh, Thyatira and he, he lays these out to them and I think it's really interesting because these are really good things to be commended for but as he has also said to the other churches to Ephesus and to Pergamum he says but there's something that is of concern and so the next thing that we see, the next thing that we sort of walk through here is the concern that Jesus had for this church. You know, I think it's really interesting when we look into Scripture. If we look into the Bible, we begin to see something really interesting. Did you know that the, of all the attributes of God, all those fine qualities of who God is, the attributes of God, holiness is the one that is mentioned the most you know we think of the attributes of God attributes like love and we know God to be the God of love amen and and, and I think it was Jordan that said uh, during the worship said you know or maybe during his prayer that we are that God first loved us that we could love him he is the God of love but love is not the attribute of God that is mentioned the most as we think about another attribute of God the, the fact that God is all-powerful. And we're thankful for that, aren't we? We think about the creation of the heavens and the earth and, and we find ourselves sort of taking, them, taking back that God could create everything that we know, everything that we see and can't see, everything that, that is created. God created those things. And so we know him to be all-powerful and yet that's not the attribute that is mentioned the most in Scripture. It's not that God is all-knowing that is mentioned. And we know that he knows all things. He knows everything. 
It's not God's faithfulness. It's not God's kindness. It's not any of these attributes that we might think of when we think of who God is. It's God's holiness. And I want you to think about that for just a moment before we push further into this text. The holiness of God. When God describes himself to his people, he says, I am holy. And that's something that we need to understand here this morning. That's something that we need to process. That's something that we need to really just focus in on. I I remember in reading when Isaiah saw the Lord's glory filling the temple, what was it that he said? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The holiness of God. The holiness of God basically describes the reality that there is no sin in God's presence. None at all. No sin in God's presence. He doesn't allow it. He will never share space with sin. The holiness of God. And so as we begin to sort of walk through this as we look at this letter to Thyatira we begin to see why holiness becomes so important God is holy and therefore as children of God we are called to be holy ourselves that we are called to be holy in our conduct And so as we prepare to read that next part of this text, as we prepare to study it, that becomes the foundation of what we're looking at here because we're looking at a church that was corrupted by sin. In other words, last week we were looking at Pergamum and they compromised. They allowed some sin to creep in. But here we see that sin really began to take over their life. And so we begin to see the contrast between who God is, God's attribute being the one that is mentioned greater than any other in Scripture, the holiness of God in contrast to a church that had given in to sin. So let's look at this. Peter says in one Verses 14 through 16, he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. But the church at Thyatira had a problem with this. They were not living their life in this pursuit of holiness. They were not not disciplining themselves to flee from sin and pursue to the holiness of God. They had a real real problem with this. And we begin to see it as we read through this text. Look at verse 20 with me here this morning. We see in verse 20 where it says, where Jesus says, but I have this against you. Now remember, he said, these are all things that you're doing well. These are ways that you're living out your life as believers and followers of Christ, and you've been faithful in these things, but this is what I have against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrifice." to idols you know I think naturally we sort of focus in on on Jezebel this this person who is really described as one who is in complete contrast to everything that God is teaching one that is evil one that is misleading God's people and I think it's natural that we would just sort of focus in on her as being sort of the problem and there's no doubt that Jesus held things against her that he you know he was not happy at all with how she was teaching and and really shaping the people of the church but I think it's interesting that we need to 
to look at something that is really hardly ever mentioned. I was quite surprised as I was studying for this text how few people talk about what I want to talk about with you here this morning because it seems as though in all of my study that everybody wants to focus on Jezebel. We know Jezebel was a wicked person. But notice, as we look at this text, it says she has taught the people of the church. She has tempted them. But look at what the scripture says. Uh, But it's Jesus' servants who are practicing these things. Do you see that? I think it's interesting that a lot of people don't seem to focus in on that. It says here in the text, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing, look at this, my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat the food sacrificed to idols. Despite their commendation from Jesus for the things that they were doing right, they were practicing immorality and idolatry. You know, when we think of things like idolatry, it's real easy for us to sort of focus our minds on a golden calf, right? To think about images carved out of wood or statues that are chiseled out of stone and and these, these little gods that we create for ourselves and we place on our mantle or in our house and we, we worship these idols. But you see, in today's church and in the church today, there's many other idols that exist without those that are crafted by the hand of man. And you know one of these idols very well because one of the greatest idols that we have in our life is ourself. You see, idolatry is sort of presented to us in Scripture as anything that we place above God. And the reality in the world today, in the church today, is that there are so many things. Uh, Comfort, our own comfort can be an idol in our life. Our own preferences of how we like to do things can be an idol in our life. There are many idols that exist in our life and we don't need to be fooled by the reality that we don't have any idols in our life. We may not possess in our possession a golden calf that we worship, but that doesn't mean that idols don't exist in our life. As we think about it, Immorality, as we have seen here, not only today, but last week, we were talking about prostitutes being brought into a place of worship as it relates to pagan worship. And praise God, that doesn't exist here in our life. I've never known a place that did that in our nation, but the reality is, There's lust that exists in in our hearts all the time that we have to be very careful about. And so we have to understand that though this letter was a very specific letter written to a very specific church, and we look at these things and we go, man, how could they do those things? That we also examine our own hearts and make sure that we haven't allowed sin to corrupt who we are as believers and followers of Christ. We love having those commendations, don't we? We love it when people say, man, great job. I I tell you, when I think of this person, I think of somebody who is a person of faith. Man, look look at this person over here and how they just love God and love others. We all love the commendations, but we have to also understand that the Word of God is warning us about sin and how sin can come in and how we can compromise with sin. If we're not careful, we can allow sin to corrupt our hearts. And So here we see it all spelled out for us in this passage. I told you there's a lot to take away from this. I've got three and a half minutes left to do two more hours worth of, of sermon, and I know you're not going to tolerate that, so we'll move on. But here's our greatest takeaway from this. 
As we think about what Jesus is saying to the church, as we look at this particular letter that Jesus had presented to the church, we begin to see that our greatest takeaway as Christians must be that we defend spiritual purity above all else. If we're going to find the fulfillment in our life that we long for, if we're going to find the peace that surpasses all understanding, if we're going to not allow the circumstances of life rob us of our joy, then we, we must go on the defense against the corruption of sin in our life. As we've been walking through Revelation, I think it's really interesting. It, it seems as though Jesus is revealing to us the marks of true Christianity. It doesn't seem to be on the surface his initial purpose as he is laying out the things that he he likes about how they're living their life and the things that he holds against them but as we look at these different churches we begin to see that and we begin to understand what are the true marks of of a believer we walk through and we see that love is a mark and we learned this from the church of Ephesus even though it was them who had failed to do this we see what not to do with the church of Ephesus and as we continue we see that another uh, another mark of believers is suffering we learn that from the church in Smyrna and we begin to realize that you know one of the things that Jesus tells us all throughout scripture is that we need to be prepared for suffering that surfing is mo uh, suffering not surfing suffering I wish it was surfing right I, I well I say I wish I'd never done it and I probably couldn't stand on a board but anyway suffering is the mark of a true Christian we are all but promised that in scripture in fact listen to this what it says here it says in Romans 5 3 through 5 it says not only that but we rejoice in our suffering knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us and so suffering is identified as a true as a mark of a true believer as we continue to look we looked at Pergamum and we realized that truth or knowing truth is the mark of a true believer and again, we learn from them what not to do, right? They, had, they were a compromising truth by allowing sin to come into their life. And then now, as we look at the church in Thyatira, we see that holiness is the mark of a true Christian. So as believers sitting here this morning studying the Word of God, looking at these letters that we've been looking at and specifically this one that we've looked at today I think the greatest question that we could ask ourselves this morning is where do we go from here how is it that this passage of scripture applies to mine and your life as we walk through this no doubt this is a another challenging passage of scripture but where do we go from here I think it's really interesting when we look at King David, we look back into David's life and we found him at times in a place of sin, that often his response was one of repentance and the seeking of restoration in his life. I want you to listen to this as I think it's interesting that what we see in Psalm 51 starting with verse 10. David says this. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. I've said at the beginning of this series that my desire, and I hope you will pray with me for this, is revival in the life of our church. Beginning with me as an individual and you as an individual, but ultimately all of us coming to that place where we really examine our hearts and we 
we ask the question, God, reveal what sin is in my life? Reveal to me what sin is in my life that we may, we may understand how to proceed. And so David, he writes in Psalm 51, he says, create in me a clean heart, oh God. And I love his heart. I love the fact that he comes to, to the Lord and he says, I need a clean heart. There's been wickedness in my life. There's been sin in my life. And I, I need a clean heart. He says, and a renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with a willing spirit. You know, when Paul was writing to the Romans, he said this. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect here's what I come to understand as I study through this series that we as believers and followers of Christ as we read through the word of God and as we pray for revival to take place in our life that we must position ourselves in such a way that God could offer unto us a cleansing. That God could offer unto us a clean heart, a renewed mind. That our focus would no longer be on ourselves. That the focus would not no longer be on the things of this world. But that truly our hearts would be conformed and transformed by the renewal of our minds that by the testing of God we may be found new how might our prayers resemble the prayers of David to ask God to create in us a a clean heart, to ask God to restore to us the joy of our salvation. I thought it was interesting this morning, I came in and uh, I guess sort of a default question that you ask people, hey, how are you, right? And it's funny how you get different responses, but you know what I believe is the number one response that I get on Sunday morning. I'm gonna just go ahead and lay it out there to you. The number one response I get on Sunday morning is, man, I'm just tired. That's what I get from people. I, I get, man, I'm tired. You know, and maybe it's the creatives that I deal with back here in the back. I don't know. They're typically ones that stay up late, right? But it's amazing to me how many of us walk in on Sunday morning and we just are tired and here's what I found this morning that as people were telling me how tired they were this morning as we walked in I found myself saying yeah me too me too I don't know why I'm so tired maybe it's because I had a light late night celebrating Georgia's win over Florida no, it wasn't that. Maybe it's just the time I was spending with my grandchildren, or maybe it's just that my mind was busy. As I was trying to go to bed last night, knowing that this morning we were going to gather together and we we're going to worship together. And in my heart was a desire to ask God to bring revival in this old heart. Maybe it was that I was just thinking about the things of God. All of that was sort of swirling around inside my head, but, but the reality is this morning, 100%, I just, I just think about all that God is trying to teach us in His Word, specifically as we walk through these letters. And, and these words are very challenging. And I, and I pray, I pray more than anything that we would sort of take this to heart, that we would... We would challenge ourselves to be, to be challenged. That we would examine in our hearts the things that need to change. 
And in the genuineness of our hearts that we would say creating us, create in us, Lord, clean hearts. I don't know where you find yourself spiritually this morning. I can only know where I find myself spiritually. And I love what God's doing in my life. I love the fact that God has, has just blessed me in ways that are only imaginable to think about. There's been so much grace in my life, so much mercy in my life, so much of God's faithfulness in my life. And as I've lived out my life, these things that Jesus commended these churches for, I've seen those aspects in my life. I've seen those aspects in your life. But it's challenging when we see the Lord say, but this is what I hold against you. And I think about the challenge that we have to defend spiritual purity in our life. How might we take these words serious? How might we take these words and not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the power and the grace of God. That's the question I feel like we have to ask, to ask ourselves, and that we as a church must ask as we move forward, trusting and believing in a holy and righteous God. Amen? Let us challenge ourselves. And when the Holy Spirit of God speaks, when the Holy Spirit of God convicts, let us turn to Jesus in a spirit 